welcome everybody to uh, our algebraic geometry seminar. Uh, we are happy, uh, very happy to have Adina again, and uh, she will tell us about uh, representations of the diagonal and the cohomology rings of the cross scheme. Yeah, please. Adina. Okay, thank you. I apologize for the remote aspect of this lecture. So, um, okay, let me uh, then I'll start. I'll try to share my screen as I write. So. Let's, uh, let's hope this works. Uh, okay, no, no, okay, good. Um, so it's, I hope it's visible, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, so we'll discuss two topics. One is something that we started last time. So this is a topic of the representation of the diagonal in, um, essentially a self-product of, uh, uh, of a modular space so will be, I mean, this is very, yeah. So, so we'll be very specific very soon. So, and the second, second uh, topic where I'm going to start to say some things about the cohomology rings of uh, quote schemes. Um, okay. Progress. Uh, sorry? Okay, feel free to interrupt any time in any case. So let's start with one. And here uh, for us, the basic fact, let me recall it since it's been a few weeks. Um, basic fact was that if we give ourselves a non-singular complete variety M, and we consider uh, the diagonal inside M times M. Let's say we have projections P and Q to the two factors. Um, well, if we manage to write, so if we can write the class of the diagonal as, um, as a um, sum of split, uh, split classes coming from the two factors. So something like this, uh, where is alpha i, beta i are just classes in the chow of M. So this is a representation in, so this is in, in the chow ring of M times M. Yeah? So if we can write this, let's call this star, uh, then, well, let's say the alpha is, but it goes the same, of course, for the betas. Uh, they generate um, the chow of M as a Z module. Okay. And so, um, so, so this is just a, it's, it's a very basic fact, but it underlies basically this whole, this whole discussion. So let me, so in other words, if for any X, of course I can write for any class X, I can write X as the sum of, well, alpha is with some coefficients and these coefficients are of course, okay. So these are some coefficients, let's say AI, okay. You can really represent it as a, as a linear combination of this class is alpha i, just because we're representing a diagonal. Okay, so, so then you can also show further. And so if, if this relation holds, then, uh, so if you can represent the diagonal as a split, then in Chow, then in fact, uh, numerical and rational equivalents are the same or M coincide. And the cycle class map from Chow to cohomology is an isomorphism. So then this M is actually Chow trivial. So it's a very strong condition. No, I mean, this is not gonna um, happen. Easily. But in any case, even if it does not, if the same representation, in, in cohomology, 
of course you can you can always split everything using the Cunard decomposition. So in for what we uh, are for what we're about to say, you know, this this might uh, at, at least on the level of cohomology, this will shed a lot of light. But okay, so so this is. Um, so the same statement holds in cohomology. Once you represent delta and you can always do it in cohomology in, in this way, then the alpha i's will generate the cohomology, okay? So as an example, last time we considered um, the, the quote scheme. So let me, so let me, this is a, this will be our first example today. We're gonna, we're gonna sort of look at this a little bit more closely. So we had considered um, what, well, we, let me denote it in this manner. Well, of course, so R and N are some fixed parameters. R is less than or equal to N. So this is just the parameterizes exact sequences. And here we're in the setting of P1. Okay, I will comment on that later, but we give ourselves these exact sequences on P1. So we're considering a quote scheme on P1. So um, this E has rank R and degree minus D. And of course, F then has rank N minus R and degree D. Okay. Um, so this, this, uh, this quote scheme in, in the case, in the sort of geometrically more significant case when uh, this is a proper grass mining, so R is less than N. This, this compactifies the space of maps to the grass mining. So in here's maps from P1 to the grass mining, which, which sits as an op of degree D, okay? Um, so this sits as an open, open subset of the quote scheme. Um, just, um, and, and what, what is it geometrically? Well, we're looking exactly for maps. We're looking exactly at those exact sequences where F is, E is always locally free in this situation, but F might have torsion. And when F is also locally free, then it actually comes from a map to the grass mine. Um, okay. So I should say before I go a little bit further with this, I should say that Basically, this subject owes a lot. I mean, the, 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 maybe the earliest thorough geometric analysis of this code scheme came in work of Ströme. Exactly this code scheme, so from P1. And this is a classic paper from the 1980s on parametrized rational curves in Grassmann varieties. Okay, so a lot, a, a lot is calculated there, and as I will describe um, as we as we go on. Okay, so um, well, this is anyway a paper from the I don't know I don't remember the exact year, but it's 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 back in the eighties. Okay, so um, so now what about a code scheme? Well, so we have seen the following that if we consider so here, are, if we consider two points in the code scheme, so let's say given by so two exact sequences, uh, E2, okay. Um, what's nice in this setting and which you, you don't have actually in a, in a strictly in a modular theoretic state when you, when you only parameterize sheaves. Here obviously we're parameterizing quotient of a fixed sheaf, but uh, when you only parameterize sheaves, you don't have this. There's a nice tautological map here. So let me, so between E1 and F2. So, so what you can do is you, you know, this, you, you use the, the first inclusion of E1 and Cn, and then you use the second surjection onto F2. So this gives a completely naturally a, a morphism. Whenever you have two sections, let's say, well, let me actually. Uh, sigma one two from E one to F two. 
And this homomorphism is zero exactly when the two points of the co scheme coincide, exa coincide exactly when you have, uh, in fact, the same, you're talking about the same quotient. Okay. So it's, it, yeah. So you, you can consider it's a, it's a non zero homomorphism, it's a homomorphism which is zero if and only if the two sequences coincide. And so what we also saw last time was that we calculated, we calculated that X1, so this is calculated on P1 between E1 and F2 in such a setting is always zero, okay? Uh, so this is this uses the fact that we're on P1. It does. It's not. Uh, it's not always true, right? I mean, if we were on a curve of, of higher genus, this would not be true. Okay. So this is simply H1 on P1 of E1 dual F2. Yeah. Just to. That's what we're talking about. So so we calculated that this is zero. So this, of course, I'm using the same sequence. This means, so let me also, we also saw that. So this is for all, for all uh, to, for, yeah. So for arbitrary points, arbitrary points in arbitrary pairs of points, I should say in the code scheme in QD, okay. So we also saw that if we, well, we, we talked a bit about the tangent space. So at, so we saw that this is equal to X zero. This is true for any cold scheme in any setting uh, of E into F. And because of this vanishing of X1, we actually obtained that the code scheme is smooth. Since this X1 vanishes, then, uh, um, okay, so we have the QD is smooth. So it's a smooth projective variety since, oh, I should have said, I mean, there, this is a projective, this is a projective variety, but it's a smooth projective variety in the case of P1. Uh, since um, x1 of e f is equal to zero. No? Um, so anyway, in that case, as a, as a sheaf, of course, I can write that the tangent sheaf is, uh, so let me, this, this will reacquaint us with the universal sheaves here. Um, so here I, I'm using the universal sheaves there's a universal sequence on the code scheme. And this is the projection. Now I'm gonna have pi, the projection to QD, and rho, the projection to P1. Okay. Um, so, um, so now we, just to, to carry through this with these observations, so we, we may also consider on, the complex, let's call this W, well, I mean, I can look at, yeah, let's not be restrictive, on the product, so this, right? So here, the setting is that, you know, these, these two, the, uh, the two indices mean that we're looking at, so we're looking at a pair of code schemes. And this is the universal subsheaf on QD on the first factor times P1, and you have the universal quotient on the second, okay? And pi is the projection to just the, the product. Okay. Um, yeah, so then this W is on, on so but X, X1 as we saw will, will vanish. So in fact, this is, this, is a, this is a vector, this W is a vector bundle. This is this vector bundle. Okay. 
if you want. So, and so of course it's on QD times QD. And what's nice about it is that it has this tautological section that we were discussing. Yeah, so for, for a pair of points in the code scheme, you always have this morphism. So this is a homomorphism from this, the, 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 um, the fiber over a pair of points of W is precisely the homomorphism uh, group from E1 into F2. And there is a canonical one, okay? So the code schemes come with this canonical section. It's a canonical section. And uh, um, as we saw, the, so we saw it, what it is on, on every, we saw the value of the section on each pair of points at every point of the product. So um, uh, in particular, we have that the class of the diagonal is precisely the zero locus of this section sigma. And therefore this is the same as the top churn class of W, okay? Um, so now it takes, um, so then we can, we can calculate the class of the diagonal by the Riemann-Roch theorem. So, well, so, so the Riemann-Roch theorem says that now, if I can calculate the churn character of this W you now, because this is just a push forward sheaf. So, Well, so the churn character of F2 is just N minus churn E2. Okay, it's the quotient sheaf. And then I have the tau genus of P1 here, one plus the class of a point. So this is it. Yeah. So now if I, we may write, of course, if I, so let's think just of cohomology now, I'll explain exactly how, so, so we may write, oh, sorry. Um, and this is important for us. It's fixing some notation for us. So we're gonna write the churn classes of the universal sheaf, subsheaf. Well, so this should come in terms of a, as a QNET decomposition in terms of the cohomology of P1. So that's just the fundamental class and which is one and the class of a point. On P1, okay. And this is for I between one and R. So there are R such churn classes. And now AI is in H to I of QD, and of course, if I is in H to I minus two of QD. And here you, you may, this notation is classic. I'm using it because it's the classic notation that Atia and Bot used in their study of uh, the young Mills equation over Riemann surfaces. So I'm just sticking with it uh, as well. Okay, so this is this for the Kuhn decomposition. Okay, so notice here that this F1, so F1 is just D. Yeah, so if one is a, um, so in fact, there are two R minus one classes of, of, of a positive cohomological degree. Okay. Um, so then if we, um, if we do this, then, um, um, well, then, then you proceed with the calculation and it's clear that, you know, the churn character of W is written as a, you know, as a sum of, let's say, poly, polynomials of homogeneous degree. Um, I mean, of uh, homogeneous polynomials of certain degrees. So these are the churn pieces of the, the pieces of the churn character. And you're going to have you know, the A variables and the F variables corresponding to the first universal sheaf and the second universal sheaf, okay? That's it. Let's say this has degree 2J. 
And so then you just uh, you just express the, the top churn class is expressible in terms of the churn character. So we also obtain this. So this is the top churn class and the top means, wow. So this is also expressible as a polynomial in, in exactly in these classes, yeah? Coming from the two factors. It's just a standard transition from churn, 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 uh, from the churn character to the churn class. Okay, and this is the diagonal then. And you see how you we've done exactly this. We have written the diagonal uh, in terms of um, um, just classes coming from the two the two factors. Okay, so so then we uh, we have obtained that. So we have obtained, in fact, that. Um, let's call this a proposition. The tautological classes are AI and FI uh, generate the cohomology of the code scheme uh, multiplicatively. Okay. All right, so now um, I just want to remark on the uh, difference between chi and cohomology because obviously this argument as I presented it is just in cohomology. I use the Kuhn decomposition, right, of the uh, of the churn classes of the universal sheaf, which you may not have, you may not have in chi. I mean, in this case you do, but as I as I will say, but okay. So the point was, let me just so as a as a remark. And here this is a remark concerns chi versus cohomology. So it comes with this fact, well, we, we had to, yeah, so we, we consider this push forward. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what got us started. Well, and this is the Todd genus of P1 here somehow, yeah? So this came from looking at M times M times P1 and projecting to M times M. Okay. Also, you could rewrite this a little bit, yeah, with the, uh, and, and so just to see clearly where the distinction between chi and cohomology comes, you can give yourself, we can give ourselves two copies of P1 and really consider things on um, the, the universal sheaf on, um, on one and then the universal quotient on the other. And I, I can do the same calculation if I just multiply by the class of the diagonal here, yeah. So this is the same as, well, so, uh, so pi star and now, yeah, so. My use of the tablet is miserable, so. Uh, okay, so, um, so this is the same as pi star, the same thing. And now I have, you know, I have two classes. I I have this thought of P1, the first P1 and the second P1. So I have two copies of P1. And of course I have to put in here the class of the diagonal. And so now you see, it's it all depends on this class of the diagonal. If the class of the diagonal itself in P1 times P1, which is the underlying variety splits, well, and it does in our case, splits in chow is written in splits in chow as as a sum of uh, you know as as fact as a sum of factors from the two um, from the two copies of, of of the variety, then then the whole product will split, yeah, because you're genuinely pushing forward. You're doing two separate push forwards from just two completely different worlds. So what you get on m times m will, will split. So so then I want to say that it it all depends. So if so if the underlying variety is Chow trivial, which P1 is, the diagonal splits as a sum of hyperplanes on the two, on the two factors, um, 
then then the diagonal will also split in chao on the on the space m yeah so this is again an observation of of, of, of Ströme. so that goes back a long a long time yeah so if uh, but this this will fail for example if we look at uh, if we look at um, an elliptic curve you know here instead of p1 the diagonal will not split in e times e which means that you know you you cannot expect this reasonably on the moduli space either yeah, so, so, so somehow, uh, yeah, so, so if the, the underlying variety, in our case, P1, the simplest possible variety is, is Chow trivial, then the moduli space will tend to be Chow trivial as well. That is what I wanted to say. So, so if delta splits, um, then inside, well, I'm, I'm gonna write. so as delta splits, maybe I should say that then so does uh, delta inside the code scheme QD cross QD. No? This is the remark. So then in particular, this shows that, uh, you know, then, then the code scheme is Chow trivial. Yeah, so, so Chow and cohomology agree in this case. There's no, there's no odd cohomology. Okay. So this is the discussion of the diagonal in the code scheme on a curve. Okay. So uh, so now I will uh, I will uh, talk about a moduli space of stable sheaves, which sort of it's more aligned with the, with the um, you know that Lothar has been talking about in his lecture so far. So let's say that M. To see to see what we can what can carry over in that setting, so so this is a um, moduli space of stable sheaves, stable sheaves on variety X, and this is either a smooth projective curve or a smooth projective surface smooth projective curve or surface. And if we're talking about a curve, there's no C2, you know, but, and I'm gonna assume there are no semi, no strictly, no strict semi-stables. Chiefs, okay. And I'm also gonna assume there is a universal sheaf just to, See how this flows, this argument. There's also a polarization, so the stability is with respect to an ample, uh, ample line bundle on, uh, uh, on X, okay? So there's a universal sheaf on X and project to X or to M. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what we can say about the diagonal in this setting, okay? Um, and there's a bit less structure floating. With the code scheme, we have a lot of structure. With the moduli space, there is less, but uh, we have stability though, so which we don't have on the code scheme. So here, let me note, Yeah, so I also assume that this is, um, yeah, okay. So no strictly, no, so it's a situation when there's no, there are no strict semi-stable. So this is, a, this is also a projective. So it's a smooth projective variety I'm dealing with here. Um, so if, if I'm trying to calculate homomorphisms between a, a pair, I consider a pair of sheaves in, uh, in M. So this is, there are no homomorphism unless, actually, write it like this, um, unless the two sheaves are isomorphic. And then they're just the, the trivial, the, the, the trivial automorphism side you have if, okay. So the only automorphisms of a stable sheaves are, of a stable sheaf are just, uh, just C-starry scaling, yeah, scaling. Okay, 
So let's assume, and this assumption is stronger than what we need, but let's let's see what it means. So it's a bunch of assumptions to set the scene. Yeah. So we're still we're still setting the, the, the stage here. So let's assume also that x2. For, for, for any pair of sheaves E1, E2 parameterized by M. Okay. And so this is, okay, this is automatic if, uh, if you're on a curve, of course. Um, on a surface, uh, it's very restrictive, of course. And so, yeah, so this is automatic. Oh, this is X, I'm sorry, X. If X is a curve, and this is restrictive, if X is a surface, uh, and so, but how can we understand it a little bit? So this X two by by third duality, this becomes on a surface, is as X zero. Times the canonical here of the of the surface, yeah. So um, dual, of course. Um, but so when might this be zero? This x zero that we understand better homomorphisms than um, yeah than this x two group. So um, so this is uh, for example, this is zero. The latter is zero if. Uh, for example, if the polarization times kx is negative. So this is by stability then. So by stability, you can never map, uh, and I think Lothar also touched on this last, last time, you, you cannot uh, map a stable sheaf of, uh, of higher slope to a lower slope, to a, to a sheaf of lower slope. And this multiplication by kx, if h times kx is negative, lowers the slope, yeah? So then, uh, by stability. So you cannot have homomorphisms from higher to lower slope, basically. Uh, well, so that happens, for example, on take P2, but you know, it, it is restrictive. You, so it's, it's not gonna happen a, um, a lot. So, um, but let's, let's, and I'll comment a little bit on that. There are ways you can strengthen this, but this is the, this is the kind of the perfect, and I'm setting just the perfect scenario for this, uh, for this representation of diagonal to work. And if the scenario is less than perfect, then you know you, you can do you have to do other things. But um, sometimes you you can, sometimes you cannot. So yeah. So but but if this x two is zero, that that's why we want it to be zero because then you can okay. So we can consider. Well, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So I'm, sorry. So I consider as before, not quite as before. In analogy with. With our first example, okay, the code schemes, uh, we're going to consider the, the complex. And here I'm going to stick a minus. On m times n. So this is the same the same um, scenario as before. You have a universal sheaf on one factor and universal sheaf on the other factor, okay? And in the context of this vanishing of X2, in fact, well, the X2, so this, the X2 sheaf in which appears in W is, is zero. So in fact, you can resolve, the point is that under our assumption, we can just resolve W by, um, a complex of locally free sheaves. So um, by a two-term complex of locally free sheaves. So you can, so under our assumption, we can resolve W by this is a complex of locally free sheaves.
So I will have a bit to say about this uh, resolution. So, so this then, so then obtaining something like this. So let's talk about these as, you can do it in several ways. There's a concrete way to do it, which I will point out, but you basically will have the following. So here is what you obtain. Let me write this. So this is a, an exact sequence on the product M times M. And I wrote this first term just for inspiration because in fact, this shift is zero, okay? It's zero, it's, uh, you know, the, so you'd, you'd expect that you see something along the diagonal. Of course, the torsion free shift is zero, but it inspires you because then you understand that it, um, the diagonal defines the, the, um, the, locus in m times m where this map from a to b fails to be injected yeah which is where exactly this x1 sheaf the x0 sheaf is is zero x1 is not a locally it's, a, it's not a locally free sheaf yeah so it uh, um uh, and 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 where it will jump rank it has a generic rank but where it will jump rank is exactly where this uh, map from a to b um, let's see if I, yeah, let's say that let's call this phi is, uh, is, uh, fails to be injected. Okay. The phi is not injected. Okay. Um, Yeah, so um, the so then there would be what we would to would have to check. So this is a degeneracy locus. So then the, this is this happens on the diagonal, right? Because unless you're on the diagonal, the x zero group is equal to zero. So x one is constant. Is given by minus the Euler characteristic of e one into e two. Yeah. So um, so then this jumping locus is precisely the uh, the diagonal. And so then you would have you would hope to write if things were not degenerate. So you may hope to write the degener the the degeneracy locus of phi, which is definitely phi. You try to write it as a as a as a class as a Chow class. And in fact, the Porteous formula tells you what it should be. Let's say the ranks of a and b are little a and little b. This, would, this is by Porteous, okay, the Porteous formula it tells you this. Um, so, um, yeah, so now what is, how does this compare to the, well, the diagonal we know is co dimension M, where M is the dimension of the moduli space, but this works out very well, in fact, right? Because uh, B minus A is the generic rank. So B minus A here, minus chi of E1 into E2, okay, which is a constant here. And, and this in turn is the, um, is the dimension minus one, yeah, of the moduli space minus one, okay? Uh, because the X group on, yeah, so it's the dimension minus one. And so then, so then this precise, then, and this works out pretty well. And this is okay, in fact, because you, the degeneracy locus is exactly the expected co-dimension, which is exactly M, the moduli space. So this is actually okay. It's not just a hope, it's, it's true. You still have to check something. So this, uh, yeah. So you, you have to check that the degeneracy locus is actually reduced, let's say, you know, so the, uh, the Porteous formula tells you, tells you that the, 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 the this churn class is equal to the, um, the class of the degeneracy locus with its natural scheme structure. So you have to check that this is exactly the diagonal, but just a smooth structure on the diagonal, okay? But, but that's easy. So, um, 
so then this is exactly, of course, this B minus A is precisely the, the complex W, okay? So it's CM of W, in fact, because this resolves. Okay, so, so, um, so then we're back where, uh, you know, we're in the same situation as before where uh, we had to work a little bit harder. I mean, on the code scheme, it was easier. It, this was a top churn class of a, of a vector bundle. The, uh, the, the diagonal was the zero locus of, uh, of a section of a, of a vector bundle. So it was a, be a beautiful setting. This is a, just a little bit more work, but not, uh, uh, but it's, it's not bad. And um, um, yeah, so then of course, so finally, as before, by Grothendieck Riemann Roch, you can calculate the churn character of W. Okay. And so then you can express the churn class in terms of the churn character PC. So in terms of uh, in turn the, the QNET components of the of the universal sheaf. So in, whenever this is possible then in cohomology, so you can then conclude that the QNET components of of the churn classes of E, which naturally, of course, they belong to the cohomology of the product. Yeah? So you, you decompose in terms of the basis for the cohomology of X, be it a curve or a surface, um, generate H star of MQ multiplicative. And of course, as remarked before, is if the diagonal um, is uh, factors inside x times x in Chow, then this also works in Chow. If not, not. Okay, so. Um, right. So um, I should also remark that then, you know, you can, this argument, of course, was given with uh, in this simply with this hugely simplifying assumption that uh, that x2 is equal to zero. So this argument was, ah, okay. So first of all, I should say that this argument is also due to Ström, eh? the argument above and maybe Boville. And Boville kind of, maybe these are these early 1990s, okay. Um, and it was adapted by Markman to work in the case of a K3 surface. This 2000s uh, for X K3 surface. Okay. Um, yeah, so there, of course, you don't have then the this you don't have this vanishing of x two. So e one e two. Well, this is this is the case of a k three surface. Um, the canonical bundle is trivial. So ah, so this is then zero. Okay, so this is. So it's zero if E1 is not isomorphic to E2, but of course it's C if E1 is isomorphic to E2, okay? But uh, in, in any case, it's a, it's a small variation and, and you, one can deal with it. So the argument is, is just, it's just an adaptation of, of, uh, of Ströme's argument, let's say, Bobby's argument. Um, okay. So one thing that I did not say as I move away from this subject uh, is to 
yeah, how do, how do you obtain the resolution? Yeah, so this relies on this resolution here. And I mean, you can always obtain it, it's a, it's a okay, but it's, you can actually do it in, and it's sort of instructive to do it um, very concretely. Yeah, so it's not, um, you know that such a resolution exists, can you actually write a concrete one? Um, yes, I, um, so I, well, let me say if I really want to say about something about this or not. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I won't actually. In fact, it's a, it's a it's a nice it's a nice construction, but uh, I see that the time is actually a bit short. So unless I don't know, I, I can go either way depending on what the audience wants. So um, my inclination is to skip it at the moment. So let me just maybe just write a remark. So you obtain, A to B from the geometry of the moduli space itself, from the geometry of the universal sheaf. So sheaf, so, 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 and the key point, and then you can sort of think about it. Um, so the key point is that, um, You can choose a large integer m so that um, the push forward of the universal shift twisted by a, a large multiple of the polarization given by m is equal to zero uh, for uh, so that the higher the higher direct images are, are zero. Okay, so this is actually a vector bundle. So if I call this vector bundle. And moreover, it's a vector bundle so that if I so this is a vector bundle on M, but if I pull it back to, to M times S, it surjects onto E twisted by H to the N, okay? So this is true on M times S, M times X. Okay, and this is true. And so this is this is uh, it's, it's sort of it's it's built in deeply into how you construct a moduli space of sheaves. This boundedness is part of it. Yeah. So the fact that you can you have this, it's it's um, uh, it has very much to do with how stability plays into obtaining a bounded family. And anyway, so if you call the kernel K here, um, then then this helps you get the resolution basically. So. Um, uh, so on M times M, um, so let me call this, you use star for E2, for E1, let's say, and you take X with values in E2. And then, and then this precisely gives you the, the resolution, okay? Okay, so you get, get precisely this. Uh, mm -hmm. Get the desired resolution. Okay, resolution of X of the X complex. Okay. So yeah. Anyway, so this is this is. Uh, So with this, I'm, I'm ready, I think, to, so we leave it, I, I leave it to the audience to finish this, <laughs> this little argument. Okay, 
so um so so now i i think i'm i'm done with the uh, yeah i said what i you know was reasonable to say about the diagonal i think in general terms and uh um i would like to go back and of course of time flies somehow here so um i'll just uh let me at least get started on my second topic here which much more is to be said in fact but uh so so this is the study of now that you have this result of generation, it was the study of, com of the cohomology of um, QDGRM in my original setting on P1. And this is instructive, it's sort of a, I view it as I'm sort of toy model for what, for what you might expect to happen in, uh, um, in an, in a setting which is not as simple, because these are, after all, quotients on P1. Okay, so chief quotients on P1. So it's a, sort of a simple setup. Okay, but it's it's it still it still has, a, has some interesting features. So so let me start by um, discussing a little bit um, the Poincaré polynomials. So. So again, this is, you know, so we're back to this setting. So where we, we're just parameterizing short exact sequences on P1. Uh, and here the degree is D would, and uh, so what's, what I think of as fixed are these parameters R and N. So the dimension of the trivial sheaf that we take a quotient of and the, and the rank of the um, the rank of the subsheaf, which is fixed R. I think I'm gonna we're gonna think of this D as moving. Yeah. So, uh, so this is n minus R D. Okay. So the Poincaré polynomial. So let's say well. Okay. So if we for every quote scheme we're indexing them by D. So there's remember there was no odd cohomology. So so let's write them as like this, the dimension. And the dimension is linear in D, yeah? I mean, I, it's easy to, so it's, it's ND. And then of course you have the dimension of the underlying Grassmannian here. Okay, but anyway, it's linear in D, that's important too. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so then you, you, we form the, the full series. So we, we, we include all these. So we form the, the full series. Uh, Z, let's say T. Okay, so Z, here keeps track of a uh, cohomological degree. And this T, the variable T of, uh, of the, the, the quote scheme, which, which space you're, you're looking at exactly, or maps of uh, quotients of which degree, okay? So we sum over all quote, quote scheme degrees here. Um, yeah, so this Poincaré polynomial, the Poincaré series was calculated by Linda Chen and the year was 2000. And it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful expression. So let me write it. So there's a prefactor here. Okay, so here this P zero is just uh, is just the um, Poincaré polynomial of the Grassmannian. So it's classically known. So let me write this. Okay, 
So this is Poincaré, the Poincaré polynomial of the grass barn. Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do a, little, a few, we just get, so it's a, yeah, well, so let's, uh, let's take a, a little bit of a closer, closer look at this formula. So first of all, I, what I, you can deduce immediately, so what we can observe uh, is that, just to get us started a little bit, is that um, B2, of QD is equal to two. So for all D R N, of course, I hear D is at least one. You know, I, otherwise, um, yeah. So this is just one. Just has to read off, yeah, the coefficients of the coefficient of Z times T to the D. Okay, in the above series. So. One can do it, uh, and it plays a bit differently. I mean, here you see this theory. Sorry. Um, yeah. So this plays a bit differently. I, there are two cases. We'll, we'll sort of look at two cases. One case is when you 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 we're talking about a genuine Grassmannian, so R is less than n, and that plays a little bit differently in this case because. Um, well, I mean, somehow, yeah, so there's a, you know, this Z here appears with this coefficient Z, Z to the N minus R plus I. And when the, when R is equal to N, in some sense, the formula is simpler and you also don't have this P zero. Yeah, so the, there's, there's this prefactor. So when R is equal to N, uh, you're talking about a point. Yeah, so this is this Rasmanian GNN, it's a point. In any case, in, in both scenarios, uh, B2 is equal to two. So then you conclude that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, A1 of the quote scheme is spanned by these two classes, which, which well, we, we knew this, the only chance was that they would be linearly dependent somehow, but they're not. Yeah, because, uh, I'm sorry, A1 plus F2, okay. Um, so remember, we, we do have at this point, we, we have the Poincaré series, but we're also looking at it knowing that this uh, class is A1 through AR and F2 through FR generate the, generate the cohomology, okay. So this is the first, uh, yeah, so let me, uh, it's, it's already, my time is already up. Let me just write one thing which is amusing and sort of, then we can pick it up next time with, because this deserves a more, a more thorough analysis. So, um, so let me write this as a remark. Uh, the remark is that the cohomology stabilizes. as D goes to infinity, yeah? So more precisely, like we'll see this on, what does it mean on the level of Betty numbers? And so more precisely, uh, we see that um, the stabilization starts to occur for D greater than or equal to K. So if we fix, uh, so this means that uh, if we fix a certain cohomological degree, then if we look for uh, code schemes of sufficiently large D, and D has to be at least K, then this, this Betty numbers will, will uh, the degree of the cohomology, I'm sorry, the, the rank of the cohomology of degree K stays the same yeah, as, you, as you move on. Um, and so this is a phenomenon which you know is more sophisticated and that Lothar analyzed, for example, in the case of the Hilbert scheme of points on a surface. Yeah, so some it's it's a phenomenon you see there as well. And of course that series is a lot more sophisticated, but this is some sort of um, 
you know, a very simple version in some sense that you can play with and it's it's the geometry is, is, is much simpler here so as we'll see if we as we develop it okay so how do we see this just to uh, we see this um yeah so if we recall it we have this we we have to we can read it off in the Poincaré polynomial and let me explain briefly how and that this will be the last thing I do so it won't be more than two or three minutes so Yeah, so let's say that we write this, okay, B to K D. This means that you're looking at the Betty number in the, the D quote scheme. Okay, so if we consider then, so we, if we write, and we can write to, to notice this stabilization, we write one minus D times, PZ of t, so this is PZ of t minus t PZ of t, you know, the full series. So, you know, there will be some initial, so I, okay, so I'm, ah, okay, so this is the part of degree zero, which I write here. And then starting with degree one, of course, I have exactly this difference, which I want to notice is zero. Yeah, so I have B2K D minus B2K D minus one, Z to the K, T to the D. Okay, so this I would like to observe that it's zero. So in other words, what we need to see is that the coefficient of Z to the K, T to the D in this modified series where you multiply by one minus T is zero for D greater than K. You know, that's what we would like to see. Um, once D is greater than K, we just want to see that this is C zero. But here is, well, so this is sort of manifest if you look at the, C, the form of the series, well, Look at the original, let me just point this out in the, yeah, in the series as I wrote it, you see here, it, this starts when i is equal to one. I'm looking at this particular, so you can, um, so you have basically two, two, types of, uh, two types of factors here. And if I look at the first type that starts with um, one over one minus t, you know, when i is equal to one. That's precisely what you won't see anymore once you multiply by one minus t, right? So, so this is just p zero of z. So you have the product of one minus t z to the i from i is equal to one to r minus one. And then the product from i equal to, um, one to r, one minus t z to the n minus r plus i. Okay. So notice what's important here for us is that whenever you have a factor of t, it's accompanied by a z. Yeah. So um, it's very it's a very easy point. Uh, in this multiplication, then you see that every t is accompanied by at least a non-zero power of z. Huh? So, so you cannot simply by z to the a for a greater than zero. Yeah. So that's that's the argument. Yeah. So then so then you're done. I mean then there's the coefficient of um, z to the k t to the d when when t is greater when uh, uh, when these uh, less than, uh, when these greater than k is just zero, yeah? So coefficient of these greater than k is zero. Okay. All right, so, so, so there is, um, 
there is cohomology uh, stabilization. Um, and so then you can also ask, so what does it stabilize to? Um, so in other words, and let me, and I'll finish on this uh, note actually. So, so if you set, let's say B to K infinity to be equal to B to K of Q D for D greater than or equal to K, then the stable Poincare polynomial of QD is well, so you you just form this series with the stable Betty numbers, um, and the fact is that which is easy to see. I will the fact is that is that you calculate this by evaluating at t equal to one, the product of the, of the original Poincare series with one minus t, okay? So I can briefly explain this, but not now. So in any case, you get the following because now we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I will, I guess, end here because unfortunately, I imagined I was going to cover a lot more than I, than I actually did, but. Uh, um, I want to point out one thing that if you set this formula is simplest when n is equal to r, n is equal to r is the, uh, so for n, let me just write this one, more. this Poincare series, but well, there's this p0 is one in that case. And then you have just this. Um, I prefer to write it as a, I could write this more compactly. Of course, this seems a little stupid what I'm doing, but it, it's, I'm doing it for a reason. Um, so you have these two distinct products. I, I view them as coming, having a slightly different flavor. So that's why I write them separately. Um, so N is equal to R is the case when you were looking at, um, uh, the code scheme of rank zero quotients. Yeah, so, so the subshift has the same uh, rank as, 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 as the CN, as the, as the uh, trivial middle sheaf. So then the, the quotient is pure, is pure torsion. So it's the ge geometrically the simplest, most accessible case. I mean, in, and so as you, what this suggests, of course, we know we have these generators. We have these Atia bot generators and so let's, so these are A1 through AR and F2 through FR. And what this formula explains in fact is that these Atia bot generators um, actually become relation free. Yeah, as, 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 D, as D increases uh, because in fact this stable Poincare polynomial, if you look at it, this is just a, uh, um, this is just um, uh, the Poincare series of, uh, uh, of just the polynomial algebra in these generators, yeah? So P infinity of Z is the Poincare series of the polynomial algebra, so no relations. Uh, in these generators, yeah, precisely with the correct uh, degrees, yeah, because, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, and you can see that the two products, yeah, one, one would correspond to the A classes and the other one to the F classes, and the F classes are, of course, by, um, 
yeah, by one by one less. So, yeah. So I my plan was to explain why essentially, you know. So it's an interesting thing, but I think we'll have to leave it for for another day. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I apologize, I went over time and uh, yeah, it's, it's, and, but it's, it's an interesting, this, where we left it off is sort of an interesting point and I hope to resume it at uh, uh, okay. the next opportunity. Uh, 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 any questions for Arena? I have one question. So first of all, thank you for the beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask if the space QD has a cellular decomposition or a fine paving or whatever it's called. And uh, yeah. because this would, uh, so the actual question is, uh, does the formula for the Poincaré series uh, uh, become a motivic? Uh, and this would be implied by the affine paving. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it does. I mean, it's this uh, in in even in the initial analysis by 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 Stromet and and also in in Linda's uh, the derivation of this Poincaré series. Uh, of course, what's used here is a torus action. Yeah, so uh, so it admits a full torus action. I mean. Um, yeah, so that so you can act with the torus on, on CN, but you can also act with the torus on P1. So in fact, you have finitely many fixed points and you have this Bialyninsky Birula decomposition as well. And this is how, in fact, this, uh, the analysis, I mean, that these were deduced. So you, yeah, you can say a lot more. And also I should say that this thing with the uh, torsion uh, code schemes, um, this analysis works on any curve. You don't have to have P1 there. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm keeping it a bit more on P1. I'm, I'm interested in any Grassmannian, not just uh, the, the, the case of torsion sheaves, which is why I, um, I assume that we're on P1 to simplify certain things, you know, but, uh, but if, I, if we are just interested in torsion sheaves, then, you know, if any curve would do. Yeah, so, but my, my point is to actually not just calculate, my point is to sort of understand, which I didn't get to, but I will hopefully in a future lecture is to, understand geometrically why that is, why this becomes relation free and what, uh, what are the relations in fact, you know? And there are two ways to approach it. And yeah, so, so to have a basically a kind of a detailed geometric understanding of, of what this series means. So, yeah. But yeah, there is, a, there is a cellular decomposition you can, you can study and it's been studied much from this point of view but not so much from the point of view i i want to emphasize so, so you know all right thanks a lot sure uh, any other questions uh, uh, it's no question uh, uh, let's thank uh, Alina again for